Good afternoon. This is Mrs. Still, and I'm going to read a book for the older students, um, part by part. I won't record the whole thing at once. Um, this book is called Shout. Here's the back of it. And the important part of this is to know that it is, it's a nonfiction told in poetry. Um, this is a follow-up to Laurie Halsey Anderson's book called Speak, um, which many of the ninth graders read last year. Many of the current 10th graders read in ninth grade ELA last year um, about the girl Melinda and her inability to speak about her sexual assault, um, which was actually the way that Anderson told of her own sexual assault that she survived. Um, so this book is now called Shout. This book also is quite personal to me. And so I'm reading this in order to share with all of you, many of us know someone who has been sexually assaulted. Some have been sexually assaulted themselves. And it's really important that we not victimize survivors anymore, that we learn to support them and give them voices. So this book is very important. Here's Inside the Dust Jacket, a memoir in poetry by one of the most crucial activists for sexual assault survivors writing today. When she was 13 years old, Laurie Halsey Anderson was a shy, bookish girl who was raped by a boy she trusted. Today, she speaks as the New York Times bestselling author of Speak and many other novels, a two-time National Book Award nominee and an advocate and activist. In this powerful and searing book of free verse, Anderson tells the story she's never shared publicly before. What happened to her as a teenager, the path to recovery she built herself, and how she turned her pain into art that would go on to help millions of readers the world over. This book is for anyone who has ever been lost, ignored, silenced, abused, assaulted, harassed, talked down to, made to feel small, or know someone who has. It's for the writers and the readers, the dreamers, story weavers, poem collectors, song traders, word eaters. It's for the heart sick and the hope filled, the furious and the fierce, the creators of call outs, and anyone with the courage to say, hashtag me too, whether aloud, online, or only in your own heart. The moment to speak has passed. Now it's time to shout. Give you a quick glimpse of the author. I know Miss Reinhardt has this available in ebook, but I thought this way would, well, I'm old school. We'll try and do it this way to read it to you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to read part of this. I'm going to read this in sections so I don't record the whole entire thing at once. First, it makes for shorter videos that upload easier. And second, because I'll likely mess up if I read the whole entire thing without stopping. So, this book is copyright 2019. Okay, by Viking Press. Um, and it is dedicated to the survivors. Introduction from the author. Finding my courage to speak up 25 years after I was rape, writing speak, and talking with countless survivors of sexual violence made me who I am today. This book shows how that happened. It's filled with the accidents, 
serendipities, bloodlines, tidal waves, sunrises, disasters, passport stamps, criminals, cafeterias, nightmares, fever dreams, readers, portents, and whispers that have shaped me so far. My father wrote poetry too. He gave me these guidelines. We must be gentle with the living, but the dead own their truth and are fearless. That's a really important statement there. We must be gentle with the living. Remember that those who are revealing their own sexual assault stories and telling their truths, those are their truths to own. And it's very important that we, as if we're a secondary victim, which is someone who is close to the person who's been victimized, that victimization carries on into the families as well. Um, as secondary victims, we n must allow survivors to share their truth at their will. We have to be gentle with them. We have to make sure that we're caring for those who are revealing these sen sensitive, horrible, personal experiences and that we recognize them as survivors and release the blame game that occurs. Well, what did she do or did she drink or was she wearing this or what did she say or whatever? Any of those things, we need to stop that talk because it does not matter at all. Nobody has the right to violate you at any time at any moment in time, if you do not give your consent. So that's enough I'll say about that. So I've written honestly about the challenges my parents faced and how their struggles affected me. The poems that reference people other than me or my family are truth slant. I've muddled specific details to protect the identities of the survivors. This is the story of a girl who lost her voice and wrote herself a new one. Riley, come close the door, please. Sorry, need my door closed. Thank you. Prelude, mic test. This book smells like me, wood smoke, Salt, honey and strawberries, sunscreen, libraries, failures and sweat, green nights in the mountains, cold dawns by the sea. This book reeks of my fear, of depressions, black dogs howling, and the ancient shames riding my back, their claws buried deep. This book is yesterday's mud, dried on the dance floor the step patterns cautiously submitted for your curious investigation of what I feel like on the inside. Before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that this is a sensitive topic and may not be suitable for anyone under the age of uh, 12 or 13. Um, but as you read it, you can decide. One. In the name of love. When I was 18 years old, my father saw his buddy's head sliced into two pieces, sawn just above the eyebrows by an exploding brake drum when he was in the middle of telling a joke. Repairing airplanes, P... 518, on an air base in England, hungry for a gun, not a wrench, my father pushed an army issue trunk into his mind and put the picture of his friend's last breath at the bottom of it. Then, 
they sent him to Dachau. Not just him, of course, his whole unit, and not just to Dachau, but to all of the camps, because the war was over, but not really. Daddy didn't talk to me for 40 years about what he saw, heard, what he smelled, what he did about it. So of course, he's alluding to the concentration camps taking place. One year of silence for every day of the flood. One year for every day from Lent until Easter. The air in Dachau was clouded with the ash from countless bodies. As he breathed it in, the agony of the dying infected my father and all of his friends. They tried to help the suffering, followed orders, took out their rage in criminal ways while their officers turned away. My father filled the trunk in his head with walking corpses who sang to him every night for the rest of his life. One day, Daddy watched a pregnant woman walking slowly down the road near the gates of Dachau. He matched his steps to hers, then stopped as she crouched in a ditch and birthed a baby. My father, a kid on the verge of destruction, half mad from the violence he'd seen, desperate to kill, to slaughter, to maim, watched that baby slip into the world. Between her mama's blood-slicked thighs, and it healed him just enough that he wept. He wrapped the newborn in her mother's apron and helped them both to the Red Cross tent set up for survivors. Stained glass curtains in my mother's mouth. Veteran of D depression, the German war and atrocities, a handsome boy married the tall girl who looked like Catherine Hepburn, two kids adrift in a city far from home, two ships ripped from their moorings. Mom told me the story when I was in high school on a night when daddy's drinking drove our family to the edge. He had to slap me, she said. It happened before you were born. The image of my father hitting my mother Picassoed in front of me like Sunday sunshine along the slicing through the church, uh, uh, like Sunday sunshine, slice, slicing through the church windows, fracturing and rearranging the truth on the floor. They lived in Boston back then, daddy studying to be a preacher, mom trying to be a wife. He had to slap me, she repeated. I was screaming screaming for reasons too many to count. The full story came out in gingerbread crumbs, dropped to show me the way. After the meltdown, the attack, they had to ride the train home to repair the damage to her face, home to the mountains, to their parents, to a clucking village of spite, her broken teeth vibrating in bloody sockets. Her husband, Horrified at the war he declared on his beloved, he turned toward the aisle thinking of escape. Her backbone crumbled under the weight of her heart. She fixed her eyes on the dark forest just beyond the glass. I wouldn't shut up, she said. He had to. The lie told to friends was that she fell, clumsy, tumbled down the stairs, so many broken teeth. Poor thing. Bad things happen in big cities, you know. The truth was that the stress of fighting the ghosts in his head broke him that night. And as they argued, my father didn't just slap my mother. He beat her. But beatings didn't fit in the fairy tales she liked to tell herself. So she sugarcoated the story to make it easier to swallow. The town dentist a family friend, didn't charge for his labor, gently apologized with every tooth. They lived with her parents all summer while her mouth healed, waiting for the false teeth. They tiptoed, but they did not touch. After the stitches came out, after she learned to mix tooth powder 
with water to make the glue that held her mouth together. After five miscarriages, five never born sons, my parents tried again and created me. He didn't ever hit her again, but she lived in the fear that he would, which had everything to do with her habits of silence. Unclean. I said shit in front of the church ladies gathered in our kitchen for coffee and donuts. Three-year-old me. The potato-shaped, sturdy-legged, parrot-tongue echo chamber. I fell down, scraped my knee, and said shit in frustration. The word I had learned from my mother, crammed and damned into the corseted life of a minister's wife, where she couldn't say shit if she had a mouthful. But alone with me, she could and did frequently. That day in the kitchen, as the church ladies eyed my mother's handmade curtains, measuring her skills, I baby cursed and was snatched from the floor. Shoving a bar of soap into the mouth of a child was then a common practice. Church lady approved for scrubbing dirty words from the minds of the young. The violence of generational silence brutally handed down. Ivory grooves deep carved in the bar of by my baby teeth Mommy's bruising fingers pinning me against the sink. My sobs, captured in bubbles, heard only after they popped, after I was jailed in my room. And the ladies of the church and my mother sipped bitterness and shared crumbs. I learned then that words had such power. Some must never be spoken and was thus robbed of both tongue and the truth. Earthbound. My mother took me to a pond when I was four years old for swimming lessons. There was a beach of sorts littered with pine needles and mothers smoking cigarettes on towels, wearing sweaters and warm socks. Summer in the North Country. Mom tugged off my sweatshirt and shooed me toward the crowd of kids standing at water's edge. The Lady of the Lake our swimming teacher, a giantess topped with a rubber bathing cap studded with plastic flowers, began the lesson. On our bellies, facing the beach, hands in the mud, legs in the water, my feet motorboated obediently. I didn't mind kicking long as I could hold on to the shore. But then the lady beckoned us into deep water one by one. I refused, even with the rest of the class staring. The lady hooked me under the armpits and pulled me in. Never trust anyone with plastic flowers on their head. I hollered so loud. The lady consulted with my mother, the other moms clucking and whispering. I won. The position at the shallowest end of the pond, where I pulled through a few inches of water with my hands in the earth, occasionally waving an arm in the air, to pretend like I was swimming, a stubborn tadpole, suspicious of the deep. Directionally challenged. In first grade, we moved Country Mouse to the city, whiskers quivering, eyes wide. Couple days later, mom put my sister in the stroller and we three walked through a drizzle of gold and ruby leaves up one hill, down another, to the new school made of bricks. Registered in the office, Mom handed me my lunchbox and waved a fast goodbye. I sat in the back row, played hopscotch with some girls, and ran hands in the air as the bells rang at the end of the day, followed the crowd out the door, the crossing guard, our white-gloved guardian. I walked down the block in the wrong direction. Went up the hill. That felt better. Until it didn't, until the houses were the wrong shape to hold my family, stopped. Back to the intersection, worried, then down the third street, the wrong third way, stopped. Back to the intersection, the fourth spoke of the wheel, another mistake. Last kid in sight, country mouse, five years old, spinning at the center of a compass that had lost her true north. A white glove waved, the guard crouched, wings tucked neatly behind her back, eyes all seeing, 
she wiped my tears and took my hand and led me up the hill again, gold and ruby leaves, farther than I dared on my own tiny paws, until we created and scurried down the other side of the houses, changed shape, and at the very bottom of the hill stood my new home, my mother waiting at the curb. Practice. Mr. Irving styled and helmeted my mom's hair, introduced her to the other ladies, permed, perfumed, fuming about their husbands and the confessor hairdresser. He knew all the juicy details. Told mom I should join the city swim team because all the kids did and it would make me tired enough to sleep better at night and not spend so much time in her hair. There was a slight delay in joining the team while I learned to swim in water deeper than six inches. But then I traded muddy ponds for cement swimming pools in schools and parks all over the city, tadpoling, backstroking, butterflying, freestyling, until my body leaned, gleamed, hardened in a core of speed with a snaggletooth grin. Didn't care much about winning, but I hated to come in last. My sweet spot was lane seven, for long, slow miles of laps, punctuated by flip turns. Boom, powering underwater, mermaid made real. I felt my gills growing. I could breathe without air. Chum. Underwater sitting pool, underwater city swimming pool. A shiver of slippery boys, 11, 12 years old, with shark tooth fingers and gap tooth smiles, isolate the open-hearted girls, eight, nine years old, tossed in like bloody buckets of chum. The boys circle, then frenzy feed, crotch grabbing, chest pinching, hate spitting, the water of froth with glee and destruction. Girls stay in the shallows after their baptism as bait, that first painful lesson in how lifeguards look the other way. Love brarians. I hate reading. Loathe the ants swarming across the page. Lost my excitement about school. Fought. Reduced to a puzzle with missing pieces. Once branded, the feeling of stupid never fades, no matter how many medals you win. But then we rode the bus downtown, me and Leslie, who majored in music and lived in our attic. Mary Poppins with a Jersey accent. We rode the bus downtown, the coins hot from my hand, plink, plink, in the box next to the driver, all the way downtown to a Carnegie library built by an immigrant so everyone could read, free and untrammeled by politicians seeking to bind them into ignorance, chain them to the wheel. Leslie promised me she'd read me books so I didn't have to be afraid of mistakes, and I wrote my name in big letters got my first badge, a library card. I asked the librarian, can I take out all the books? And she answered quite seriously, of course, dear, just not at the same time. And so with extra Leslie help and a chorus of angels disguised as teachers and librarians for years unstinting with love and hours of practice, those ants finally marched in straight lines for me, shaped words, danced sentence, sentences, constructed words for a girl finally learning how to read. I unlocked the treasure chest and swallowed the key. Poem for my favorite teacher. Mrs. Sheedy Shea taught me haiku. I word flew off the page, amazed. Hippos. Indoctrined by magazine covers of skeletal white privilege like the Kennedys, only peasants ate, apparently, my parents, poor clan and striving, rose to the occasion and smothered my hunger by pinching my hips, grabbing the fat under my chin when I was eight years, 10, 14, 25 hungry years old. When they grabbed and pinched, they called me baby hippo. The insult disguised as love. 
They said others would tease me for being so fat, so I might as well get used to it. Closeted Shame When we were girls, we rode horses disguised as bicycles. Though anyone with eyes could see from the way we leaned, preened their manes, galloped across the plains without ever leaving Dorset Avenue, their true equine nature, we were magic-filled girls at large in a world of pedestrian dullness. After riding hard, we walked to cool down our steeds, feed them sugar cubes, pump their tires, straighten the playing cards in the spokes that made the thwack a thwack a thwack a thwack, announcing our arrival. Knees, always skin, crusted with scabs from tripping over the buckled sidewalk that was heaved into the air by killing frosts and held there by the roots of long dead trees left broken to teach children lessons about watching our step. I use my jump rope for reins and a lasso for runaway calves and the whirling dervish of girl games, sky jumping, earth touching, clap backing, shouting with rhymes. We got tangled up a lot and fell. Splitting open our half-heeled knees, we licked our bloody wounds clean and we started all over again. My bike had a shelf on the back, an ornament, I guess, but made of metal. One day, I let a friend's little sister ride on the back of my horse, on that shelf. Her shoelaces tangled in the spokes, her leg twisted at a horrible angle, then broke. Her screams drove me to the linen closet, where I hid for hours, sobbing, burning with the horror that I'd heard her. Not my fault, but yes, totally my fault. And she wore a heavy cast for months. I stopped playing horses after that. The taste of shame smells like stubborn vomit in your hair, lingering no matter how often you wash it. Sometimes you have to shave yourself bald and start again like a newly hatched chick leaving the faint rot of broken magic in shattered eggshell pieces behind you. Payback. After Charlotte's Web, but before Little Women, my sister stole the key to my green plastic diary and blackmailed me with what she found. We shared a room split in two with masking tape laid down the middle of the floor and the closet, the lines never to be crossed. I hadn't committed felonies or misdemeanors yet, I was in fifth grade, but still she tattled about what I wrote, how I cheated in math and planned to do it again. I repaid her treachery by telling stories in the dark while we waited for the sleep. Said I was a vampire, the moles in my neck to prove it, part werewolf too, casting stories by the light of the moon until she cried for mom who yelled at me for scaring my sister and grounded me so I never did it again but I threatened to whenever she crashed through the border. Maybe I owe her, my sister, for stealing the key, toying with my secrets and thus igniting the slow fused inevitability of me weaving stories in the dark. Amplified. One, daddy loved Jesus. Talked about him so much when I was little, I thought he was a cousin, maybe just a second cousin, which would explain why he was never at grandma's for Thanksgiving. Daddy was a preacher on a college campus. He worked in the chapel, and I could walk there myself to say hello if I looked both ways before I crossed the street. Number two, my job was school. I was really good at recess and lunch, but I failed climbing the rope that hung from the sky in the gym. I tried to be sick every Friday so I wouldn't fail the spelling bee. The playground was a war of girls versus boys, and now I feel shame because some kids must have wanted to stand with the other team, and some must have wanted new teams entirely, but the world was drawn for us, binary and clumsy chalk lines, and we'd try to do better when we were in charge. Three, protests against the Vietnam War echoed across the campus. Our house filled with angry students every weekend, and my mom fed them vats of spaghetti and trays of brownies, Daddy worked all the time because students were getting so high they thought they could fly and they jumped out of dorm windows five stories up, which was awful. And the sadness and rage and the protests and the soldiers and the yelling and the guns and the FBI tapping our phone and the corpses of Dachau 
made it hard for Daddy to sleep, and he could smell the ashes again. And my mom thought he was killing himself, and he was, but he was doing it in slow motion. Four, I finally learned to read, and they finally integrated our school, and the new kids were really nice, and long division was impossible, and my mother cut my hair wicked short, because swimming, and everyone thought I was a boy, which was not funny, because I wasn't, and I didn't want to be one. Boys were gross. Number five. Daddy was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention, and he forced us to listen to the Watergate hearings on the radio. He hated Richard Nixon with all of his heart and soul. When drunk, Daddy threatened to kill the son of a bitch because he was destroying the country. I watched the level of gin in the bottle and realized that counting the bottles was more important. Number six, spring of sixth grade, all of us crammed into the music room, sticky hot and stinky because we were almost seventh grade graders and the chairs were too small and our hormones were blowing up. But we were children who smelled. It was a confusing time. Our music teacher, Mrs. Shermerhorn, dragged us through a rehearsal for the spring music musical performance that no one wanted to hear. We were terrible singers and horrible children. But something happened. The planets lining up. God's playing cosmic checkers. A butterfly flapping in Bangladesh. She made us sing, climb every mountain. Yeah, that one from Sound of Music. When Maria and her family stop in a convent as they're escaping the Nazis. A song about doing hard things. We sang that song without fooling. And we were finished. Mrs. Shermerhorn coughed, cleared her throat, warned us not to move, and she ran out. Of course we moved and gossiped and complained and farted and rolled our eyes. It was June and we only had a few days left. Number seven. This all went down right around the time my parents stopped worrying about things like school concerts and report cards. I thought I was the only kid with a house on fire, but I wasn't. Number six, number eight, Mrs. Shermerhorn returned with our principal, Miss Hartnett, and she told us to sing again. Nervous, too many yearlings in a small corral. We didn't want to obey, but we had no choice. We sang Letting Go, opening, and 90-ish voices, some cracking, some strained under the weights unseen, murmurated, a flock of swooping starlings, harmonizing, resonating, shaking the windows in the pane, bending the laws of physics to the pure hearts of children for the length of a song from a Broadway musical that made two brilliant, kind, ignored women cry briefly and lifted us to a place we weren't old enough to understand. First Blood when husbands raped wives in 1972, it was legal. Property rights were all the rage, you know. I got my first period in 1972, and I didn't know why I was bleeding. When bosses groped women in 1972, it was legal, because bosses, all of them male, made the rules. We girls saw a film strip in 1972 about hygiene and sanitary napkins, so confusing because it never mentioned the blood. When women were fired in 1972 because they got pregnant. In 1972, it was all very legal. In 1972, no questions were ever asked. We learned boys were dangerous in 1972 because their pee could get us pregnant and kicked out of school. The FBI spied on women in 1972 and it was legal. Men feared the liberation movement might change all the rules. My mother lacked a mouth in 1972, so she couldn't explain the mystery of the blood. She gave me a pink box of tampons, directions hidden inside, then closed the door between us. No words. Fencing. Levi Junior High, 7th grade, long dark walks to school on winter mornings, whirled deep bundled in snow. The game was to scuttle into the street, grab hold of the back bumper of a school bus or the bread truck, 
let it pull us down the frozen roads of Syracuse, sliding toward the Eleusinian, Eleusinian mysteries of adolescence. Mom hated that school because mom hated that school because of the knife fight but i liked it though my shyness limited to the sidelines you can learn a lot from watching quietly a great art teacher taught us how much fun it is to make things from scratch eighth grade another year another school me the quiet scholarship kid mom was happy because there were no knife fights there were no fights of any kind unless you count the upper school cutthroat competition for valedictorian I was a cheerleader. Can you believe it? One third of the base of a girl pyramid, pom-pommed in modest, itchy uniforms. I lured to fence with an epi. Studied sumacs, danced the steps of fragile friendships. But it was Mr. Edwards who changed my life. He didn't just teach us Greek mythology. Mr. Edwards ensorcelled us with the stories of gods and wars and mothers in search of lost daughters and girls fleeing rapists by turning into trees. I wanted to stay in that school forever. Cemetery Girl. When not swimming, my middle school summers played out in Oakwood Cemetery, where I lay on a flat, warm tomb day after day, and read, 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 book belly starving for pages fantastical, haunted by lost, hungry girls, I ate red apples, heavy salted on the tomb. The sleeping Victorian corpses below me fed me secrets. Sentinel owls peered from a grove of old pines, all of us hoping, waiting on signs of the change that was promised. <sighs> Driven. My father first let me drive when I was 12 in the woods on old logging trails only a couple times in town when he was over the limit. I drove in sheer terror, never crashed, not even a scratch in the paint. He was proud of me, and that meant a lot. My mother never knew that we forged a secret alliance in the middle of our Cold War nuclear family meltdown. So when it was time for her to teach me how to drive, I faked it, pretending I didn't have a clue. Anti-crescendo. My mother hit me in the face for the last time when my father lost his job, lost us to the wildfire that scorched the dining room table, burned up the drapes while bombs dropped through the ceilings. You have to seriously screw up to be fired by the church because love, Jesus, etc. plus plenty of preachers play out shame mistakes in glass houses, so they rarely throw stones. But my dad... He was targeted by petty jealousies and for dumb mistakes. They called him on the carpet and wiped the floor with him. Subtle, ceremonious, excommunication, hell. Oh, that says bell. Bell, cer ceremonious, excommunication bell, book, and candle-wise. Dad's pedestal tipped. Dad's pedestal tipped over and he had a great fall. And all of the king's horses and all of the king's men didn't give a damn. I argued with him about something stupid, so confused that our life was in flames. Dad told me to shut up as he stormed off. I stuck out my tongue at his retreating form just as mom came around the corner with a mean backhand and explosive temper. She hit me. I was almost as tall as she was, just as angry and much, much stronger. We stared at each other after the blow on the edge of annihilation, Worldless, wordless combustion, but she was my mother, so I swallowed the lighter fluid and tilted my head until my face became her mirror. Like I said, that was the last time she hit me. We're going to stop there on page 47, and we'll pick up with another reading in another video. Thanks for reading along with me.